دع الأيام تفعل ما تشاء وطب نفسا إذا حكم القضاء ولا تجزع لحادثة الليالي فما لحوادث الدنيا بقاء وكن رجلا على um, what should I ask uh, Dr. Yasser Qadi? A lot of them had um, kind of your journey as uh, an intellectual, your journey growing up in mind. So what I wanted to ask you was, I want you to kind of put yourself in a position of a young student in Medina University. What were your general experiences in Medina University? And more specifically, I wanted to ask you about your dealings with those individuals, if I could call them that, that kind of follow Sheikh Rabi al-Madkhali uh, vehemently and um, and kind of uh, you could say they are followers of him. Did you run? A, did you come into contact with those individuals? And what was your experience? I think this is the first time you would uh, answer a question like this uh, publicly. So, what, what was your experiences uh, with them? Subhanallah, that's a. <laughs> I'm shaking my head because um, it's an awkward topic. I try my best to be as fair and as just. I don't. I don't like speaking about other uh, individuals and other um, movements in a, in a negative manner as much as possible. At the same time, um, uh, I fear that those who don't learn from history are going to repeat it. And what we are seeing now is the rise of, and I've said this explicitly on Twitter and Facebook, and I've given, you know, not full lectures, but hinted at it, that what we see now is the rise of a new neo madkhalism It's a manifestation of, of that trend. And these youngsters that are in the refutation cultures online, it seems as if they have no clue as to the damage that uh, this movement did. And I don't like using the term madkhali because it is uh, a derogatory term from their perspective, mm. but I don't have any other, um, um, so I, I don't intend any derogatory meaning. I don't know any other word for it to, to use. Now, I'm going to you know, open up here and then really we're going to go down memory lane. Um, mm. And the reason I'm doing this is so that I want people who are, influenced by this refutation culture to learn from history and to see that these 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 are not new movements there's nothing new about this 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 obsession with finding the faults of others and thinking that you're defending islam by exposing you know the battle and the deviancy of uh, people while where you know while you yourself have not trained and the people that mm. you're refuting are whether you like it or not, it's just the truth. They're older than you and have studied more than you. And the people that are older and senior than them are not doing what you are doing. So mm -hmm. I want to go down a little bit of memory lane. And I'm going to begin by stating that, you know, um, forget medchalism per se. As a psychological trend, mm. one can find this sort of manifestation in every single movement in the world, whether it's a political movement or a religious movement. It transcends Salafism. And I think one of the best examples that uh, I would encourage all of you who are listening and are interested to just do even a Wikipedia entry on this is the American phenomenon of McCarthyism back in the 50s, okay? Mm. McCarthyism and Madkhalism are the exact, they're, they're two sides of the exact same coin. And if you mm. study McCarthyism, right, you understand this was the essence of the mindset of Madkhalism. It's, it's not a new trend. It, it's found in every single movement across the, gro the, the globe. And McCarthyism mm. is the perfect example of what happens when you start obsessing over who's on and who's off and who's a deviant. And it's the perfect example of the rise and fall of a movement that is going to become popular because it rides the social wave of anti-communism or the Madkhalis or you know, anti-Salafism or whatnot. But then it eventually you know, starts eating itself up and eventually fizzles out and leaves a very bad reputation and a lot of damage is caused in its wake. So uh, Madkhalism, uh, and again, I don't use the term derogatorily, I don't know any other term to use. It is of course a trend uh, within modern uh, Salafism. Uh, that was started by not actually Sheikh Rabi, it was started by somebody by the name of Sheikh Muhammad Al Jami, who was the teacher mm. of Sheikh Rabi. He was an African scholar uh, who came to uh, Saudi in the 50s, I think, and then you know stayed in Medina and passed away in 1996. I actually met him once uh, as a freshman or a first year student. And uh, historically, this trend manifested itself after the first Gulf War. It was the first Gulf War in 91 in Saudi Arabia uh, that really split up the Salafi da'wah uh, officially. Before this time, you had 
trends, but they were all together. The, the, mm -hmm. the first Gulf War, when the Americans uh, came uh, uh, by the invitation of the king and the royal family, and they established military bases an hour away from Mecca, you had hundreds of thousands of American troops, you know, in Arabia, uh, literally an hour away from Mecca and whatnot. And uh, this is when this, the movement split up. And you had, for example, you know, certain groups, you call them the Sahwa scholars, led by Sheikh Safar mm -hmm. al Sheikh Safar al and others, who they were not calling for rebellion, but they were saying accountability. They were saying that you can't just invite in, you know, uh, the troops and then ignore that there's a civil, there's a people here. You do not have the right single-handedly to bring in, you know, 100,000 American troops. This is a country. We are Muslims. We are living, you know, together. We should have a say in what is happening over here. They did not call, by the way, for open rebellion. They did not call for an overthrow of the government, to be clear. Other movements did. The Sahwa scholars did not. Now, in response to this, uh, Sheikh Al Jami uh, spearheaded a movement that was eventually taken over by his student Rabi' Al Sheikh Rabi' Al Madkhali after his death. And the main issue that they had here was the theologizing of political acquiescence to the establishment. They made it a point of aqidah that to be a good Muslim, you need to be faithful to the king. Okay, and not only that but that if anybody wasn't loyal enough, they are a fifth column that will destroy Islam. So you need to rat them out. You need to refute them. You need to socially ostracize them. You need to shame them for the sake of Allah. So politics and religion took on a type of, of wedding together, which you still see you know, to this day. And they took an element which is found in the, in the traditions of Ta'at Wali Al-Amr and again, this is a deeper discussion I don't have time to get into. The Madhari interpretation of Ta'at Wali Al-Amr is definitely not mainstream Islam. And the irony of ironies, and I've said this many times, how can any student of Ibn Taymiyyah, how can anybody who studies the biography of Ibn Taymiyyah end up a Madhari? The two are absolutely polar uh, uh, issues apart. Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah even refused to listen to fiqhi fatwas uh, that he disagreed with, the triple qala'a. The Wali Al-Amr, the Sultan, forbade Ibn Taymiyyah from you know, uh, giving this fatwa. And he's like, yeah, whatever, I don't think you're right. And he gave the fatwa. As for you know, um, uh, uh, advising the ruler, Ibn Taymiyyah is well known. He went to jail multiple times because he felt that uh, you know, he didn't call for rebellion. But again, advising the ruler's public mistakes are corrected publicly. So the point being that um, Madhalism did have this merging of political quietism and religion, such that to be a good Muslim, you must follow the king blindly and to dare disagree with the king to dare even express that hey i don't think that's valid you are sinful in the eyes of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then of course what happened here is that it quickly escalated into uh the book definition of a social cult i mean madhalism truly is a cult if you study the psychology of cults a social cult it is a hundred percent a cult because if you were not with them you became an outsider, a deviant. And again, this is the same with McCarthyism as well. And what happened, of course, is the standard topic, tactic, just like McCarthyism, is that you have to be vetted by a group of people. Are you on you know, the manhaj of McCarthy? Are you on the manhaj of Rabir? Or are you off? And, if you, mm. and how do you decide that? Okay, so you look at who you're socializing with, okay? Uh, and of course, again, the same thing uh, goes with, if you look at the McCarthy phenomenon, the exact same thing. And uh, I was uh, admitted to Medina in 1995 uh, when the Madhalis were at their, their pinnacle, I would say. And uh, it is now well known, and I actually heard this myself, myself, mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. the, uh, from the Minister of Education directly at the time, because I'll get to my story as well. I was in the Minister of Education's office, and I heard this, and he goes, and when he heard what happened to me, which I'm going to come to very briefly, he literally said, Oh, yeah, I'm sorry about that. We're the ones who put them. We're the ones who put them in power over there. Meaning, Madhalism became a useful tool for the government. The government obviously wanted the strand because it, it, it is beneficial to them. And so this strand and whoever was a part of it was given certain social clout and certain privileges amongst them was to decide who would be admitted, who would be promoted, you know, which jobs would be given. And even though there were always a minority, statistically, a very small minority, they had far more clout and they were given much more power than the uh, majority. And mm -hmm. the irony of ironies, and subhanAllah, I mean, this is looking back, I mean, I was wondering about this when I was a student here. The followers of this movement were typically converts to Islam and typically Muslims who 
did not grow up in practicing households. They discovered Islam very recently. They got accepted to Medina. And out of all of the strands, they jumped to the harshest and the most يعني, cultish mentality. And at the time, I didn't understand why. Like, Alhamdulillah, myself, I grew up as in a practicing household. And pretty much all the other students who came from practicing households with any bit of ilm, they did not end up. Um, Saudis, by, by and large, were not mainstream madkhalis. Yani, this irony. We had more French madkhalis than Saudis. We had more British madkhalis you know, than Khadijis. I mean, it's just bizarre that mm -hmm. the majority of practicing Muslims that were in Medina, they, they were not a part of this movement at all. There were more Western converts than there were, uh, were from, from uh, Muslim lands. And the reason for this now, it is obvious to me at the time mm -hmm. when I was 20 years old, I didn't understand. The reason for this is self-evident. Mm -hmm. There is a psychological appeal. How and why? When you join any such movement, whether it's McCarthyism or whether it's Madkharism, when you join these movements, what happens is you get a VIP pass, a quick track to empowerment. You go from being a nobody to automatically having a sense of superiority over everybody else, right? You get this self dezkia instantaneously. Who wants to be put in a long line of hard hours to study, many years to master the text, you know, just reading after reading? Who wants to do that when you can bypass all of that and label all of those who have done it as being evil and misguided, thus instantaneously giving yourself, it's a, it's a quick reversal of power dynamics, right? It's an yes. instantaneous reversal of power dynamics that you start off with nothing. You see these people that have memorized the Quran, they have all the ijazat, they have studied the books of fiqh and whatnot. And you, if you wanted to do that, it would take you like five years, seven years, like whatever, you just joined this movement. Ah, they're all muftadir, they're all off the manhaj. And what's happened, mm -hmm. all of a sudden, you are the person in power and with your dismissal, all of that has been very easily eliminated. But of course, these movements come with many dangers. And I've, I've, I have a Facebook post a few months ago, and I have some points in mind that I've said. And I, I want, um, I really wish that those that are in this modern refutation culture is on the rise again. I really wish that they were to study history and to see that subhanAllah, these people, you know, they rise for a while, but then they just fall crashing down and they don't impact history in a positive manner. They end up losing themselves, most of them. And they end up as well causing a lot of damage. So what are some of the negatives that I would like uh, this, the, the open-minded amongst them? And by the way, my philosophy, even in Medina was always the same. I was there for 10 years and um, uh, I, I would like, this is the first time I'm going public about this and I'm even now, yes. I'm gonna be very generic. I don't like saying these things, may Allah give us all ikhlas and uh, uh, always protect I mean, us from using but, our but we need, we need we need to, we need your experience yeah, Sheikh. we need to know what happened yeah we it's very it's happens. a very you know so if you if you look at my dua book um the introduction yeah. to the dua book i mentioned in the paragraph that i was undergoing a very serious crisis at the time i was constantly mm -hmm. making dua to allah and therefore that book is my favorite book because i wrote it with passion it came from the qalb I was making dua and writing the book on dua. One of the biggest crises in my own life took place when I was writing that book. And so you yeah. feel the spirituality, I think. And then it was literally when I was finishing the final pages of that dua book, when alhamdulillah, the dua I was making was answered by Allah in what I still say is a mini miracle that Allah blessed me with. What happened? So uh, because I was not yani madkhali, and I was the most prominent Western student that wasn't Madkhali. Uh, and Alhamdulillah, any straight A's, as you know, I mean, you know, the top you know, percentage of the class. Uh, so, uh, the, and as I said, the Madkhali still had power. In, in opposition to many of them who got kicked out and who couldn't get... Uh, uh, get to, to be honest, to be honest, the default amongst the Madkhalis was that they would be expelled or kicked out. In fact, I don't know... Yes. I don't have in my memory right now a single Madkhali that actually graduated and is successful in da'wah. I, I don't have anybody in mind right now. So yeah. um, some of them failed and continued da'wah as, 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 you know, after never graduating. Many of That's them right. just fizzled out. They stopped practicing Islam, by the way, subhanAllah. The majority of them, and this is what's going to happen, we're going to come to these points. A, a few of them, uh, alhamdulillah, they repented and they yani, uh, apologized to me and others, and they're now giving successful da'wah. They're no longer of that strand. So what happened in the year 2000, um, mm -hmm. I was uh, graduating from the College of Hadith, and I applied to the, uh, the master's program. And this is the first time I'm, I'm going public about this. And I want to say this because, again, it just, it's, it's, it's something that is still painful to me, but I think there's benefit, and may Allah preserve our ikhlas. So mm -hmm. we were applying to the graduate level, and at the time, in the year 2000, there was no American 
in the graduate program. The majority of American British students were dropouts at the time because it was a very difficult uh, time frame for all of us. It was a, the old curriculum, which was very differ different and difficult than the new one. We had the, you know, it was a very different time frame. 95% of Western students dropped out of Medina and did not graduate. 95% when I was there. Wow. We had a handful of graduates. And Alhamdulillah, Allah blessed me to be not just a graduate of the College of Hadith, but in the top notch, yani with an A grade, basically, Mumtaz, they call it, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, this was almost unprecedented for any Westerner, not just uh, American, almost unprecedented in the history of Medina. And I applied to the, the, uh, the graduate level Aqida. I wanted to do Qism al-Aqida. And in the entire university of all of the applications that came in, they had to give a special exam. Uh, Alhamdulillah, this is the first time I'm saying this, but everybody knows who was there. I had the highest score in the entire university, no exceptions amongst the Saudis, Kuwaitis, Khadijis, everybody. The number one score from an American student to get applied and the only one that got an A in the introduction exam, or what do you call it, the um, admittance exam, you know? So mm -hmm. to apply to the, 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 the masters was very difficult back then. So an American, half of the Quran, with hijazat and Quran and Hadith, with an A from the College of Hadith and the A and the only A from the admittance exam, this is a no-brainer, right? I mean, obviously, yeah. you need Jealousy. a Westerner. What's going to yeah. happen? These madakhila, they started a petition, and their mashayikh as well, and these, their mashayikh are known as well for this, that he's not yani, a proper yani, Salafi, okay? He's, the, he's basically a, a you know, Hizbi and whatnot. And, and, and so they petitioned, and it was a very vicious battle within the jamia because, again, the University of Medina has its own strands, and the Madkhali strand is one strand, and then you had other strands. I had mm -hmm. so many professors and teachers fighting on my behalf, but you see the majority are not vocal publicly. They are, mashallah, mainstream wiser, yeah. right? It's the Madkhalis yeah. that are the minority that are <laughs> barking the loudest. Loud. So yeah. there was one particular person, may Allah forgive him, who had a high up position who was Madkhali. And my, my petition kept on getting pushed up, pushed up until it reached this person, and he, in a manner that was unethical, and immoral, he pulled my name out in a very evil, it was totally not allowed because everything has been met. Anyway, he did it. And I was given the khuruj ni'ahi to go back to America, okay? Like I was denied my, my master's level admittance because they said you are not yani, a madkhali basically, okay? And my teachers told me to go to court. My teachers, my professors, my mashayikh said, take them and sue them. Okay, and they said do this and did, and I followed there. I didn't actually end up suing them. I went to, um, uh, you know, uh, this is when I started, you know, getting involved in the Saudi process, which is another issue altogether. Uh, Sheikh Ibn Uthaymeen got involved. He wrote me a tazki, alhamdulillah. Uh, I visited many mashayikh, you know, I'm really with the Sheikh. He, 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 no, 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 he gave a tazki as well. Oh, yeah, I have his letter. I have his tazki. So I said, yeah, yeah, please, him, please uh, throw in, in <laughs> Trust gonna me, they're going to ask for that. <laughs> I have so it. Yeah, see that. Trust me. I, I studied in Uneza the year that uh, the, before he passed away, right? in the year 2000. He passed yeah. away January 2001. I was the last batch to study with him in the summer of 2000. Uh, so I went to mm -hmm. Uneza uh, because, and that was the semester that I had Khuruj Nihai, like I was supposed to leave. Right. So I go to Renez, I study with him. Alhamdulillah, I got to know him. And so he heard of my case and he wrote me the tazkiyah. Uh, you know, my, my, new, my, my case became well known amongst the scholars of the land because mm -hmm. it was such a blatant, uh, you know, uh, misuse oppression. and abuse of Serious power. Oppression. Yeah. Just yeah. because of madkhalism, right? Yani because I'm or, not a fan of the madkhalism. Yani. And a Western student at that, there had been zero American graduates from, you know, the PhD level, zero. Now, nobody's been there since the beginning of Medina and Westerner. And you're going to deny me because what? I am not a card-carrying madkhali. Seriously, that's the reason. It's unbelievable. So I visited uh, uh, Sheikh, uh, because I was in Uneza, I visited Sheikh Salman for the second, third time. But when I walked in, uh, he's like, oh, you, no, Sheikh, uh, uh, Sheikh Salman, yeah, Sheikh Salman. He's like, oh, you're Yasser Qadi, the guy I heard about. I was like, what? <laughs> it, it, the news had reached him. This is the first time he got to know me. After that, alhamdulillah, we met more often. But he had heard about my case. I visited Riyadh to get petitions from the Shaykh. They all knew that was happening. It was like an, uh, the news spread everywhere. Like even between the Saudi Mashaykh, it became a very you know, sensitive issue. Like this is ridiculous, man. How, how much hatred much. are you I mean, even have? as you speak you know? now, I'm getting a little bit angry, I have to say. 
to be so honest. I was so I was denied, and that's when yeah. I got letters from so many mashayikh, and I went to uh, you know um, Sheikh Uthaymin, I went to so many, and then also the the uh, somebody hooked me up with the Minister of Education, and he heard mm. my entire story, right? And he's mm. like a poly, in his office in Riyadh. You know, and he's like mm. apologizing to me, like secular guy, you know, clean shaven. He's like, he's like, sorry, kid. You know, we we put them there for our reasons. This was not what we intended. You know, what I'm saying? we didn't uh, want this type of stuff what, to oh, happen. You know, what I'm saying, oh, yeah. So yeah. this is the point. Like, you know, he literally told me, like, yani, I was, people don't know this, and I, I don't like to say these types of things, but yani, this is the reality. That how can you be so naive as to not understand that your version of Islam is very conducive and very very beneficial for a certain strand of government? Government, right that it's very mm. convenient for them to push you through and that's what happened and of course what happened was lawsuits and people like me and others and after a while the government quietly just withdrew their support because it became socially unacceptable the same with McCarthyism. It's, it's, I, I right? thought the same thing that nowadays I don't think it's uh, it's part of their narrative to have it's, it's exactly it's not it's not it's not official anymore right and mm. the same thing with McCarthyism is like you know, it, there was a time when Joseph McCarthy was the most powerful politician in America. And within five years, his own people and party turned against him. There's an infamous clip online. You need to watch this. It's like, you know, the, the, the Speaker of the House says, have you no shame, Mr. McCarthy? Like, are you going to stoop to nothing? Everybody's a communist in your eyes. But when he was in power, he caused a lot of damage. Now, again, I was going to talk about this, the issue of... Um, oh, yeah, what happened to uh, you? Yeah, tell us about what... Oh, yeah, okay, what happened? Yeah, so, I mean, basically, the... the um, uh, you know, the, all of these letters and the ministry. So alhamdulillah, yeah. both the people of deen and the sensible people of politics. And I even yeah. petitioned the, 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 the governor of Medina, who was the brother of the king at the time. Wow, and this is a serious well. war that you went into that no one knows because about. Because my oh, mashayikh told me, my mashayikh said, we want to use you as a case. Like they, they, because no, everything, fine. like check, 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 bro. Number one in the exam, yeah. what more do you want, you know? Like yeah. American, half of the Quran, ijazat and multiple qiraat and hadith. Like, what more do you want, man? Seriously, yeah, right? And, the, and so, and, and so they, they, and, and, and subhanAllah, you know, many of my close and near and dear friends did not get in because of their, their nationalities. You know, the Libyans and whatnot, they, they didn't get in. But someone like me, my mashayikh wanted to use me because I have the American card to show how yeah. nonsensical madkhalism was, right? And yeah. so I had the support of many scholars and many people in politics. And that's what happened. They used my case. And alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, that's the, the phone call that came now. I was literally in front of my computer finishing the dua book. And somebody I never even met or heard. And so my Allah, case was Allah, well Allah. known. I don't know how I got my number. He goes, Yasser, I'm from the ministry. I just wanted to call you to say, thank Allah. You're going to hear some good news in a while. And he hung up. And Allah. I just fell into sajda, crying. Allah brings memories back subhanallah because i don't Allah. know who the guy was but my case was being and you're right you're not book at the same time finishing the final pages finishing that's like the a final story pages. i have come to the hear about this before man because okay, i try to protect the faults of my brethren but i feel that because there's a new neo madkhalis coming they need to hear these types of things to understand so what yeah. are some of the dangers of this madkhalism of the past and also the new madkhalism that we see now there's many dangers well, what happened First, after before you get to that what happened after that what was the good news that you heard the good news was that uh, my application was there was a special committee assigned by the ministry and by the king's brother they said they literally a khitab malaki came uh, whatever you call it, that a special committee, excluding the one guy that <laughs> didn't want me on, is going to be mm -hmm. assigned to look into the case of Yasir Qadi, like by name, right? To see yeah. whether he should get in or not. And when it comes from the government, you know what they're saying is put him in, okay? So mm -hmm. a very atypical, exceptional scenario was done. And like I said, it was a miracle because this had Allah. never happened Allah. in the history of Medina. And I don't know if it's ever Allah happened after Allah. me. It truly, and I still say this, like it is something that Allah blessed me with because of yani, the du'as that I was making at that time. And then after that, because of the help of so many, you know, mashayikh and shafa'at. And yani, as, I, as I said, it was a case mm. that had implications beyond me. And it yeah, was definitely. at a time frame when madkhalism was beginning to be withdrawn, the support, right? And so yes. my so case- That's a serious piece of history. Yeah. Allah is a serious piece of history. Yeah, it's interesting, and I've never been public about this, but again, I think it is important that we now, uh, and uh, by the way, well, that's giving me shivers when you were telling me that as soon as you, you and you're the last page, you get the phone call, it's all lies. That's, that's like a, it's like a dream. Literally, literally, and I'm not exaggerating, I'm finishing up the pages, like finding, you know, I've wow. finished the first draft, finishing up, and you know, it's, and, and that's why in my book, in my book, the introduction has that. 
and the book is published January 2001. And it took three, four months to edit, you know? So it's all like, mm. it's, it's there, you know? Uh, and by the way, every student of Medina who was in Medina in 2000 knows this story. It was a very public news, the Madakhira yeah. and the non-Madkhalis. They all know this because I became uh, a cause celebre as you like. Every student, uh, non-Saudi, everybody knew it was like a public scandal because, because of, again, the dynamics and whatnot involved. And, you know, as you're aware, some of the, the Madkhali teachers, may Allah, يعني, you know, forgive them and whatnot. They actually released videos about me. It's still online, Sheikh Muhammad ibn Hadi. By the way, Sheikh Muhammad ibn Hadi is my teacher uh, from the College dropped, of Hadith. Right? which is again, one of the points I'm gonna to come to. That's what's gonna happen, right? At the yeah. time frame, you know, uh, he was the big shot and he taught yeah, me. Yeah. And yani, when I got into the masters, he released a video against me, which is still online. Like, the talib and the rasul, may Allah yani, forgive him and me. So he is of that strand. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Sheikh Rabia himself, by the way, I was his neighbor in Awali. Uh, I used to live no in the way. same neighborhood as him. Uh, and I visited him privately when I first got there because when I got accepted, I applied in 1994. Uh, and uh, I had no idea what madkhalism was. I mean, just an is a Salafi. I just thought everybody's the same, you know. So I had no idea what's going on. And the American and British converts predominantly were madkhali. And again, I didn't understand at the time. Now I understand why. Because when you're madkhali, you get this self-ego, like I am upon the haq, for example, you know. So I was just with them. And I got to know Sheikh Rabia and, you know, Alhamdulillah, because of who I am, my language, my questions, whatnot, I, Alhamdulillah, people, yani they, they like me, whatnot, some of them. So mm -hmm. I got invited to Sheikh Rabia's house multiple times, yani, without the other mm -hmm. students. <laughs> At the time, I didn't understand, but there's this spider sense in my back. This doesn't make sense, though. I, I don't understand mm -hmm. what, what he's saying. Yani, I'll give you one example before. I, there's mm -hmm. um, some points I wanted to, but one example. Another yeah. uh, Sheikh that's famous is Sheikh Ubaid al-Jabari. And yeah. I remember this very clearly that the first semester I was in Medina and I'm learning Arabic. Uh, and this is before Kuliyat al-Hadith. I'm in the Arabic program, right? And so one of the Madkhalis, uh, and they're all dropouts. They never graduated, those guys that arranged these meetings. They arranged that we have a private yeah, yeah. meeting with one of the major scholars. I've never heard of Sheikh Ubaid al -Jabi. I don't know who he is. Okay, let's go. And that was one of the main points that said something is psychologically wrong with these people. I went to their house, his house. And again, may Allah forgive him. I'm not personally, but the idea that he had was wrong. And I, again, I was there. I heard this with my own ears. Nobody can tell me something else. So all of us, mm -hmm. 30, 40, um, not 30, maybe 20, I think, British, Canadian, Australian, uh, went to his house. And there's some new Muslims, converts, you know, they've converted a year or two ago or whatnot. And the whole lecture was against the Ikhwan and Muslimin. Okay, what the heck has Ikhwan got to do with these, these new converts? Teach them some basic. So anyway, one of the new white converts from Canada goes like, Sheikh, this is all news to me speaking English. The masjid that we have in our community, we only have one masjid from some small town in Canada, you know, and it's run by somebody who's uh, an Ikhwan. What should I do? Should I, you know, go and pray with them or, or what? I don't have any other masjid to go to. And I remember I was so shocked when I heard his response. I actually turned to the guy next to me and said, did he just say what I thought he said? What did the Sheikh say? And I was there. He said, لَوْ كُنْتُ فِي مكانك فِي المسجد وَصَلَّيْتُ الجمعة فِي البيت. <laughs> This is what Sheikh Ubaid al-Jabari said to a new white convert. My jaw just dropped. Like, what? And I didn't can you, know... Can you translate that? Sorry, because oh. a lot of them will not know. <laughs> if I were in your place, I would yeah. not pray behind them and I would pray Jum'ah in my house. And when I heard this, and I'm a 20 year old jahil. Like I don't know anything about the advanced aqeedah and salat khalq al which is discussed in the books of fiqh. And Imam Ahmad is saying that if you have no other choice, you go be, pray behind the uh, actual mubtadir, not ikhwan, but an actual mubtadir. You don't leave the jama'ah, you know, for even somebody who's an open fasiq or whatnot, right? Not, mm -hmm. I didn't know any of that, but because I've been raised in a practicing household, there's enough common sense in, in me that says these people are, are, are off common sense. They, they're just, I don't even know, I don't, I don't want to be too harsh, but they're not yeah. mainstream. They are a cult. Yeah, yeah. You're going to yeah. tell this, that, and I see the kid, he's like, oh, okay, I guess I won't pray behind them now, you know? What world are you living in that you're going to tell a new convert? Anyway, so I have a lot of horror stories like that, that these people are just mm. so problematic. And so what mm. happens? What are some of the dangers of that movement, and then also yeah. of this new strand of the refutation culture. These are now all the same mentality. They don't call themselves Madkhalis, but it is a new strand. A number of things come yeah. to mind. First and foremost, when you start following 
and exposing the faults of other people, you end up neglecting and not concentrating on your own faults. And this is something that goes against the prophetic traditions that really are a core of what it means to be a Muslim. We are more concerned about our mistakes than the mistakes of others. I swear to you, as Allah is my witness, I am more worried about even the smallest mistake I've made than the biggest deviations of all the ulama of the world, of all the callers, because I have to answer to myself in front of Allah Azawaj, about myself in front of Allah. Mm -hmm. I don't have to answer for the other people. Now what happens when you concentrate on the faults of others is that automatically you get a sense of kibr, a sense of arrogance, mm -hmm. a sense of lack of spirituality, a lack of, and that's why almost all of the madkhalis of Medina, and you can ask any of the students that were there, are dropouts of Medina. They didn't even 100%. graduate. Where are they now? Yeah, we know. Yeah. Where, where are they now? During my time frame, over 200 students came in and out. And those that were of that strand, I mm. cannot at this stage, and maybe, you can, maybe somebody can correct me later on, I cannot recall a single one of them ever graduating and then going on to be successful in da'wah. Many of them, the bulk of them, fizzled out of even practicing Islam. Some of my worst enemies of the Madkhali strand with, mashallah, the biggest fears and the hardest deviation, your muqtada and whatnot, I heard later on that they completely left praying five times a day and they're doing this and that and drugs, lifestyle. This is what's going to happen. The, the, the madkhali burnout is going to happen because you're concentrating on the mistakes of others rather than thinking about yourself. This is one point. Another point mm -hmm. is that what happens here is that you start believing that every slip up or every mistake is somehow worthy of being exposed and you are somehow defending Islam when you talk about the mistakes of other people. And what happens is you typically end up creating a much bigger scenario out of nothing. Shakespeare said, much ado about nothing. Sheikh Rabi'ah, so many times, may Allah forgive him and guide him, would accuse Sayyid Qutb of every single crime known to humanity. And he would accuse... Uh, uh, well known. And, and he mm. would say that all of the mashakil of the dunya go back to say every mushkila in the Muslim ummah. I heard him say this multiple times, by the way. Every mushkila in the Muslim ummah can be traced mm. to Sayyid Qutb. Like, seriously, bro? He <laughs> claimed, you know, and again, I'm not a fan of Qutb. They can call me whatever they want. Any Qutb is a mufakkir. He has some good ideas, some bad ideas. I don't spend my time reading him or refuting yeah. him. He's a person that came and left, you know? But, yeah. you know, she, she, and he, the, the Madkhali Strand and Sheikh Rabi explicitly accused Sayyid Qutb of things that Sayyid Qutb's closest disciples and followers never got the impression of. For example, the Quran is created. For example, cursing the Sahaba. For example, so all of these ideas that he was accused of, the people closest to him, right, never got those ideas from him. You know, the, the followers of Qutb don't go around saying the Quran is makhluq, we are mu'tazili. They don't go around, you know, cursing the Sahaba. So what you see here is that a lot of times you read in the worst interpretation. And you then extrapolate the most evil, you know, possible interpretation. And I see this now happening with me and Umar Sulaiman and others that literally 95% of what I'm criticized for is within the valid spectrum of opinions or complete misunderstandings. Yes, 4 to 5%, whatever. They're genuinely positions that I understand are atypical or not mainstream. And so we can go back and forth. Like the Ajuja Majuja, I have no problem with somebody understands where I'm coming from says, hey, this is not mainstream. You're right, it's not mainstream, no problem. But the bulk of what I'm criticized for are people who themselves, they're reading in the mistake or they don't even have the knowledge to assess the mistake you know, and, and, they don't, and they're not qualified to then go ahead and, and, and comment on it. And this leads to another issue. And that is the issue of self-piety. Mm -hmm. That is why, as I said, so many people who newly practice the deen, so many people who are new converts, they love this path. Because it's an elusive fast track. You get ahead of the line. You get to the top without putting in any of the effort. And again, a sad reality. Wallahi, I don't like saying this, but... It is not surprising that when you concentrate on the faults of others, your personal life suffers. And I know too many horror stories from my Medina days about those brothers. I'm not going to say them explicitly. I will give one anecdote without name. So please, nobody read in anybody. Anybody whom you're thinking of, inshallah, somebody else. I'm just telling you now. A few weeks ago, a few weeks ago, a uh, sister contacted me online. Uh, got my email and whatnot, sent me a long email about one of the main people who 
uh, criticizing me on YouTube, right? One of the main people sending videos and whatnot, explaining how she was taken advantage of in a secret marriage, and then she found out she's not the only one, and she had, and she goes, because he's refuting you, I want you to have this information so that you can then, you know, expose he's doing, and it's not only me, he's doing this to multiple sisters, right? And subhanAllah, firstly, I said, I'm not the right the person. The same sister must have... Uh giving me the same details <laughs> so again it's the reality bro this guy you would think he's sheikh al islam when he's finding every mistake of yasir qadi he must be the most zahid abid muttaqi when he's talking about other people and there's a long list of sisters that and the sister says here's i can give you the number it says look yaqi look yaqti firstly because of this personal animosity you can't come to me because of this, I'm not the right person. I said, go to Fulan and Fulan, and inshallah, to they, they might be able to. <laughs> I, I didn't tell her that, but I'm saying, I mean, it's up to you. you know? And that's the second thing I have to say, it didn't shock me at all. Because hmm. those people who are the most angry at their fellow Muslims and think that they're the most deviant in reading at other Muslims, I know from my Medina days, their mm -hmm. personal stories and their ibadat and what they, I, I know. This is the reality, Akhi. Yeah, when you correct. concentrate on other people's mistakes, it's going to burn out and you're not going to concentrate on your own. And my genuine advice to these brothers and sisters, you have to answer to Allah for yourself, not for me, not for anybody else. And what we also see, this is, we saw this in the Madkhali strand as well, is that typically these people end up attacking those who are benefiting the Ummah the most in areas yeah, they yeah. themselves are not benefiting. And I saw this myself, yeah. the names of the, the mashayikh that were Madkhali are one tenth, one one hundredth as successful and popular as those who are outside the strand. And you wonder, yeah. are these guys sure that no personal issue is coming in? I mean, is anybody truly qualified to open up his own heart and negate any jealousy, any hasad? Is it really appropriate for somebody who is almost unknown to criticize somebody who is his senior or maybe even a peer? Is that really it's something that you can say has nothing to do with your own nafs and ego. So any movement whose initial success and fame is defined by refuting established success, established individuals, it is doomed to failure. Your success cannot be by destroying other people. History teaches us this time and time again. And that is why, by the way, I don't spend much time defending myself. I honestly believe and I I hope I don't come across as arrogant, it's not my intention, but history teaches us that all of these people, they will not even be a footnote in tomorrow's books of history. Not even a footnote. Well, technically there'll be a footnote, the Madkhalis did this and that's it, right? <laughs> history goes on. Nobody cares about the, the, the critics and the haters, nobody. And I even yeah. said to one of them online, Akhi, if you really disagree with me, show a better way, produce a better lecture. Do a better right. seerah series. Wallahi, akhi, I pray right. for the success of those who want to do good for the ummah. I'm not saying mm -hmm. my series is the best. Go produce a better series. I brought up problems of Ya'juj and Ma'juj. You solve them in an academic matter. Go for it. And I make dua for you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you with even better so that the ummah is protected. The issue is not about egos and personalities. The issue is That's the right. ummah. So rather than get involved with my mistakes, do something better. Show the product better and then say, hey, look, I've done this in a better way and I will make dua for your success. But you see, that's what happens when, you know, you get into this mindset. And you know, the biggest problem in all of this, and this is what hurts the most, is the confusion of the innocent masses who don't understand. You embroil them in controversy and the average person gets involved in practicing. He looks up to Umar Suleiman, myself, or whoever else they refute, Mufti Mank. Yeah. And by the way, all of them, the more successful you are, the more deviant you are in their eyes. Look at the irony here, right? So yeah. then this innocent person starts listening to Mufti Mank, Umar Suleiman, myself. Then he comes across. That's, that's, yeah, well, like, that's, the, that's the main thing that I, I found was destructive about this thing was that. Exactly. exactly if, if someone's going to build their iman of someone like Mufti Menk or someone like uh, Mufti Mune or someone like Tahir Rai or someone like Amr Sulaiman or Naman Khan or yourself, and then they're told after that, actually, this person is off completely. It's not like that, oh, he's got some akhtar or he's got some things here. He, should, he shouldn't have said it like this because everyone has. He's saying that this person's completely. This person is completely deviant. In other words, don't listen to him. There's no benefit that you can get from that person. It's not kullu insan yu'khadhu minhu wa yuraddu alayhi that everyone has some things and you can refute them on some things. It's not a nuanced approach. It's that this person is completely off. Exactly. I find that this, yep. even yep. if some people accept that narrative, it might actually destroy their whole iman. And it so might destroy their whole iman. people by turning people away from those people, you actually end up turning away from Islam itself. Because... 
here's the point. These people yeah. that are refuting, they lose the forest for the trees. Let me be, again, very explicit here. A, a Mu'tazili yeah. is a million times better than a Kafir. Okay? Mm. Uh, 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 are, you trying to, are you trying to justify Mu'tazilism? No, no, no. <laughs> I'm, get, I'm getting to you. the next example here. There are people in England, in, uh, uh, in uh, um, Belgium, in uh, America from Pakistani yeah. origins, right? Their views are not mainstream mm. Sunni. Their views are somewhat Mu'tazili. But I don't refute them by mm. name. I disagree with them. Very famous people speaking in Urdu, very famous Arab you know, person in, in, uh, in, in Europe, very famous doctor there. You have yours in England as well, another person coming up. And you know, I disagree with much of their views, I really do. But I would never, as of yet, do an entire lecture by name refuting the person. Why? Two reasons. Number one, the person might repent. Why would you want to mention him by name? It's the idea, not the person, okay? Talk about the idea. You disagree? Bring in the concept and then talk about it. Number two, much more important than this, when you understand the types of people that are attracted to those individuals, okay, you realize that these people, if they didn't have that individual, most likely they'd be outside the fold of Islam. Most likely they wouldn't even be praying and practicing. And wow. somebody who is listening to Dr. Fulan from that world or Sheikh Fulan or whatnot and praying, and fasting Ramadan and believing in the Quran is infinitely better than somebody who has left the deen or somebody who is not praying and practicing at all. And so we need to be gentle in our correction because we don't want to sever them from their only connection to Islam, right? So this involves hikmah. When you look at the broader picture, don't mention shaksiyat, mention the concept and say, oh, we should believe in the sunnah. Oh, it's not right to bring doubts about all of Bukhari. Oh, to, to, to deny the virgin birth does not make any sense. You talk about concepts, not individuals, mm -hmm. right? And I have no problem. Yaqi, there are people that refute me with ilm, and I say, may Allah Azza wa Jal guide both of us to the truth. I have no problems with you. Refutations mm -hmm. with, between the people of knowledge with ilm is a part and parcel of the territory I have chosen. It's the people who don't have ilm and the people who don't have adab. Sometimes, it's, you know, the, the issue is the language and the, the, the technique and mm. the, 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 the audience that you're doing. And by the way, uh, positions within Islam are really not black and white. The more you dive deep into fiqh, the more you understand that, you know what, I might have an opinion and the other opinion also makes sense. And dare I say this, and, and I know you agree with me, but I know many of our viewers don't. Ash'ari and, and Athari Aqeedah. When you're at a superficial level, each side is certain that they have the evidences and they're fully 100% certain. But that's superficial ilm. The deeper you go into those aqidas and the more encyclopedic works that you read and the refutations and counter refutations, all of a sudden you realize, you know what? I see where they're coming from even if I don't agree. That only comes with a deep dive. It doesn't come with the superficial ilm. If you only study with Ash'aris, you will think the Salafis must be a bunch of idiots. Well, if you only study with Salafis, you're like, how can Ash'aris not see the light of day? Right? It's so self-evident when you're at level one, when you're a beginning student of knowledge. When you do a deep dive and you study Ash'ari Mutun in detail, I'm speaking as a previous Salafi, or if you're a, 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 a Ash'ari, if you actually study a Dadimi and you study the, the, the books of the, of the Salaf, you study Ibn Taymiyyah in detail, all of a sudden you read a Tabari, for example, and you read it cover to cover, you're like, oh, well, I'm not cover to give you my point. You're like, oh, okay, I see, I see, okay, I see where you're coming from. You have some, some validity. So all of a sudden you tone down and you gain a little bit of sympathy for the other side. So what this shows us, and of course this is a saying well known, a little bit of ilm is very dangerous, very dangerous. Yeah. And the more ilm you have, the more humble you become. And that is why a hallmark of madkhalism and McCarthyism and neo-madkhalism is that you have a group, Sufaha al ahlami Hudatha al asnan young, mm. overzealous, undereducated throughout. The major mashayikh, Shaykh ibn Uthaymin, Shaykh ibn Bas, others, mm. they never got involved in this. They can't. It's, even though they did not, another point I want to say here, you know these guys, the Madhavis, they always say Bin Baz is on our side, Abani is on our side, and uh, you know, Uthamid is on our side. This is all a lie. Everybody knows this was inside the movement. I was in Uneza when a strand of Madhavism tried to influence the students of, of the Sheikh, and he gave a public lecture in Uneza. You know the famous lecture that he said that when Salafis start deviating, leave Salafis and go back to the Salaf. There's a famous clip. That's why it's not Ibn Uthamid said that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He said that, and I was 10 feet away from him sitting under him. It's not something I heard on a cassette. He said that, and I was in that gathering, the famous gathering. Why did he do that? Because 
a certain student of, uh, had come who was from that strand and he was preaching that strand. And Sheikh Uthameen did not like this at all. You want to see Sheikh Uthameen's manhaj, look at his students in Unaiza. Look at his son-in-law, the one who has taken over. Look at his core students. None of them are madkhan. You're going to tell me that, oh, because he generically praised Sheikh Rabia. No, this is hikmah, ya akhi, which again, in hindsight, I don't know if it was the wisest thing to do or not, but it was hikmah at the time. You don't want to make it worse. He praised Sheikh Safar and he praised Sheikh Rabia. You know, he praised for the same way Sheikh Mibaz, you find positive statements here, you find positive statements there. They, they were above this frame. They didn't get involved in this. And hindsight is 2020. Should they have, should they not have? This is something that is difficult to say. But bottom line, the real methodology of the kibar of ulama is not to get involved in refutations to this level. It is petty. It is, becomes personal. And if you must refute, refute the idea without mockery, without a sense of harshness, be absolutely academic. And if you have a personal issue with the person, you should not be the one refuting. Definitely. Because you do not know the recesses of your own heart. Is it because you're jealous that he's more this or that? How do you know? Go to somebody whom you are certain that has none of these issues. And go to the senior ulama. And I'll finish off. I know you have another question here. I'll finish off with this point. With regards to Sheikh Umar Sulaiman, Mufti Mak, myself and others. All of us are minor students of knowledge compared to the kibar. I'll be the first to say this. Allah has tested us that because we speak fluent English and because we're born and raised here, you know, we have more clout than others. But you know, America has ulama. Sheikh Salah Hassawi is somebody I look up to immensely. He is a person who used to how, teach at Ummah. Uh, one of the questions on this, sorry, just to, um, yeah. to kind of add this. One of the questions that was one of the most popular questions is how would you define Ailim? Before you talk about okay. the Ailim. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, my point is, so let me finish this, I'll move to your question. Uh, mm -hmm. Go to those ulama with your problems about me and Umar Sulaiman and yeah. others. Go to those yeah. ulama. Have your issues yeah. that, Sheikh, we disagree with this point. Because you do not know so many times you might not understand or you might have a different, or you, you, you might not even be qualified. Go to those that are actually qualified. And then you know what? If Sheikh Salah were to call me and say, you know, yeah, I said I disagree with this issue and I think it's wise that you don't say it anymore. Wallahi, I would be, I'm not going to guarantee, but I would really take it to heart and really think long and hard. Like somebody from him coming to me and saying, you know what, this is causing fitna. It would have an impact that some impetuous 20 year old self recording from his car is never gonna have on you. You know what I'm saying? Like you're not qualified bro, to, you don't even speak English and you're coming in and talking to me about this. So go to the people of ilm and then they are gonna solve amongst themselves because they will also know, okay, you know what? Maybe Fulan has this one mistake, but he has 99 good things as well. So maybe it's not wise to just publicly blast. And yeah, I keep on saying this last point, but yeah, some of these brothers, may Allah guide them. The very fact that they create a drama online without coming to me or others first, and they have indirect contact, Access. the very fact yeah. that they can figure out, hey, you know, did you mean this or not? The very fact that they rush to Facebook and Instagram and YouTube and create a drama out of it, may Allah protect me and them, but it bodes an evil niyyah because that's not the way it is done. If you really and truly have a problem with somebody, go to the right channels, verify, ascertain, make sure it is something that is worthy to be made public, and then bismillah if you're qualified to go. But these brothers, I find out their reputations because of YouTube clips or whatnot, and to scour, yeah, my guy, I have an admin, he told me I have 1,700 uh, YouTube videos. For these brothers to go through those clips and find something Obsessed. seven years ago, right? Three yeah, seconds. Obsessed. Mm. Yeah, what are you doing with your life, man? Worship yeah. Allah, leave no, me you alone. Know, it's Allah not only that. Do you, know, do you know what? They actually, they've got charity. Like, for example, in the UK, they've got charities, um, you know, well-known charities. They get money and they get, they get zakat money. So, in effect, a lot of these people, that's what they do as a job. So, people are paying zakat for Yasser Qadi and for Bilal Phillips and for, I don't know, Mufti Menk to be refuted. Uh, I mean, on me personally, they've written 350 pages. Um, you know, I, I think I they've probably written more on you. <laughs> yeah, it's, probably it's, have. I mean, yeah. that takes a lot of time. And I can see because they're, they're time stamping things and they went through all of the videos. And some of the videos, it's, it's like trivial ones, like me speaking uh, yeah. in, the, in, a, in a park or something like that. I so couldn't it's, be it's, careless, it's the kind bro. of level of obsession. It's the level of obsession is, is, is yeah, staggering. Okay. We have one life to live. And I have to answer yeah. to Allah for the time I have on earth. Do you think I'm going to spend my time talking about other people? Let them, yeah, yeah. history shows, history shows that they're, they're right. going to, anyway, may Allah, may Allah.
grant us ikhlas and qabul. Anyway. Okay. يا من أجبت دعاء نوح فانتصر وحملته في فلكك المشحون يا من أحال النار حول خليله روحا وريحانا بقولك كون